thanks for coming out tonight. It's kind of cool. I got time to talk to everybody. It's pretty neat. To do any kind of college campuses is the name of the program I'm going to walk you through, and it's also the title of the 2016 uh, book. Now, this month marks 41 years since I graduated from Eastern Michigan University. Proving the theory that you can only be young once, but you can be immature all of your life. <laughs> Now, being a member of the class of 1976, I tend to take an old school approach as I'm writing my books. And for this book, what I did was I spread a Michigan map out on my desk and I plotted where all the college campuses were in the state of Michigan. And I was very surprised to find the large number that had a river that either flowed through the heart of it, such as at MSU, or maybe was a boundary river to the campus property, or maybe even a short drive away. So for this book, I held and wrote about 20 of these river college unions. Now, one of those river college unions closest to where we're at right now is the Huron River as it flows from west to east on the northern edge of the U of L campus. The section of the Huron that's closest to campus begins in the west at the Argo Canoe Livery. And if you, from Saline, maybe you're driving through downtown Ann Arbor and heading north on Main Street, look to your right. And you see the Huron River, and beyond the river, we see all these beautiful multicolored kayaks and canoes. Well, that's the Argo Canoe Livery. So it starts there, and it flows to the west, and ends at Gallup. Now, the neatest part of this 90-minute trip is in the first 10 minutes. It used to be that as you paddled up to the Argo Canoe Livery, you were faced with the Argo Dam, and you had to portage around the dam. Well, in 2012, a channel was cut into the river, so you got the main body of the river flowing from west to east, and this channel was cut, and a body of water is now running parallel with the main portion of the river, and it's a little 10 minute run, and that is the Argo Cascades. Now you can see in the distance, the river is dropping a little bit, but in this 10 minutes are nine drop pools, or steps, and each of them is a mini whitewater run. The last 80 minutes is beginner friendly, a nice flow, but these first 10 minutes, there's a lot of tight turns through narrow openings, so you have to have some experience in paddling. You can see one of the drops right here. That's a great view of the drop and then the tight turn you have to go through. Very, very enjoyable. Now, for those of you who navigate by tavern, the Argo Cascades are 200 yards directly north of Casey's Tavern which is right by the Andy Dancer, uh, by the, uh, right across from the Antrim uh, station on Depot Street. Now here's the ninth and final drop. And as you're paddling along to the north of the main body of the river, you go underneath this last bridge, and now you are emerging back downstream from the dam with the main body of water. So this is just a little glimpse. I'm gonna take you through five of the 20, but I want to give you a little glimpse of the Huron River and the Cascades, something else I want to give you a glimpse of, because I thought it was so cool. One of the river college unions is the Caucallan River, which is next to Saginaw Valley State University. And I was going to paddle the Caucallan that afternoon, but earlier in the day, I'm walking around campus doing research for the book, and I came upon these fantastic sculptures. I involuntarily parked my car and started walking towards them. They are sculptures done by Marshall Fredericks. Marshall Fredericks is a gentleman due to the spirit of Detroit downtown. When our sports teams are successful, it's clothed in big jerseys, 26 feet tall. Well, anyways, in 1988, he donated 200 of his sculptures to Saginaw Valley State. And as you're walking or driving around campus, there's all these gorgeous statues, just fantastic. I found this to be the most moving one. It's called Black Elk. And it shows a Native uh, American who was just taking a spear while it's right above him. Very, very cool. Marshall Frederick's Sculpture Garden is what it's called, Saginaw Valley. Okay, so in the book, this is the second page, and we're going to talk about one river from the UP and four in the lower. And the, and the one in the UP is also the first listed alphabetically, and that is the Beta Grease River, French for the Gray Beast. And that is also the one furthest north, way up in the Keweenaw Peninsula, just to the northeast of Michigan Tech University. There is one other river uh, in the UP, and then the other 18 are in the lower. And although we won't talk about it tonight, I will mention that uh, it's the Escanaba River as it flows to the south from Northern Michigan University. Now, the next page in the book has the outline of the lower peninsula, and within the lower peninsula, there's four rivers we'll talk about. And uh, the first one is in the bottom right hand corner, we're going to take the Rouge River as it wraps itself around the U of M Dearborn campus. 
Now, on the same latitude, that over in the southwest corner, we're going to take the Makatawa River as it flows from east to west on the north side of Hope College. And then we'll look at the Red Cedar. We're going to handle a seven mile stretch of the 45 mile long Red Cedar, putting in before campus and taking out beyond campus property. And outside of that, we're going to wrap up a little, just a little bit downstream from the Argo Cascades. We're going to go back on the Huron River and take it as it wraps around the north and eastern side of my alma mater, Eastern Michigan University. Now, I have two different dedications in this book. And the first is to my mom and dad, Herb and Mary Fletcher, because they sent me off to college and they were the first to introduce me to Michigan's waters specifically Lake Michigan, our family vacation from the mid-50s all the way through the 60s was us leaving our Detroit home at 3 a.m., always at 3 a.m., and making a three-hour drive across the state until we hit Grand Haven as the sun was coming up, right at Lake Michigan. We stayed at a little place called the Belmar Inn with this beautiful Sand Street parking lot. You knew you were right at the lake. And as we all ran down, the kids down to the lake, my dad would go in and take care of business. Uh, the Belmar, and I can remember in 1960 or 61, they charged $5 a night for the whole family, and if it rained, you got your money back. Which leads me to ask myself, how old am I? <laughs> <laughs> now, the next dedication is to this wonderful lady, Betty Jane Harlow, who passed away just before Christmas of 2015. Betty Jane was blessed to have her house on the south bank of the Looking Glass River in the town of White Coast, about 20 minutes to the west of Lansing. And in 1970, she decided that she was getting a little restless, and with the house on the river, she thought she'd open a canoe lift. And so she bought five canoes from her good friend Gloria Miller, who I should mention today, at 92 years old, is still the president, and very active president of the Looking Glass, Friends of the Looking Glass River. In fact, there was a four-day trip down the Looking Glass last year, and at only age 91, uh, Gloria participated in all five days, or four days, excuse me. So anyways, Betty bought the one of these from her friend in 1970, and over the next 45 years, she expanded her business and introduced me and so many others to the beauty of this great river. Just a wonderful lady, sweet, kind, very interesting. You would walk in her house a stranger and come out a friend, Betty Jane Harlow, really amazing lady. So the first of the five river college unions we'll look at is circled in red. We're going to take the Rouge. We're going to start at the lower branch of the Rouge for 45 minutes, follow that east, and then it'll intersect with the main branch of the Rouge right near Fairlane, the backyard of the Henry Ford Estate. And then we'll take it as it wraps around U of M Dearborn, just a photo of U of M Dearborn's campus. 10,000 students attend classes on a 200 acre campus. Seven of the acres form a nature reserve right along the uh, Rouge River. Now, U of M Dearborn has always been very closely associated with Henry Ford. In fact, the Ford Motor Company donated the land to build the university. And this is the home that Henry and Clara Ford uh, lived in, Fairlane, from when it was built in 1915 until their passing in 47 and 50, respectively. Built in 1915, and just to go off on a tangent for a minute, because I am a big Tiger fan, that was the first year the Tigers ever won 100 games, but the Boston Red Sox won 101. Mm -hmm. Kind of sound like 1961, Tigers won 101 to Dan Yankees, and excuse me. <laughs> it's usually another adjective I use that's worse than that, so we're actually doing pretty good. Um, so 45 minutes into this trip, a two-hour trip, right where the lower branch coming from the east meets the main branch, right there is, you'll see the backyard of Fairlane in, a, in some subsequent slides. It's one of the most fascinating landmarks I've ever seen while paddling the river. We'll get into that in just a little bit. So you have as neighbors, you have been born in Fairlane and the friends of the Rouge River. Now the Rouge River, most people, certainly my age, think of, hmm, didn't it catch fire in 1969? Why would I handle this river when there's so many great rivers in the state? But the health of this river has been restored amazingly well, due in large part to the activities of Friends of the Rouge. They've been working as a volunteer group for over three decades now. They have a Rouge rescue every year. Uh, they had 28 communities all along the Rouge last year pulling trash out of the river, uh, installing native plants, and taking out uh, foreign ones. Um, they are great stewards of the river. They have been able to 
teach and motivate both private citizens and businesses and government agencies to make better decisions on how they interact with this beautiful waterway that they're, they're next to. And one of the great stories on the restoration is the restoration of our rivers isn't just relate, isn't just uh, kept down to the southeast part of the state of the Rouge River. All 20 of these rivers that I've held for the book have a volunteer group that has been very active in making a difference on restoring the health of these rivers. So now we're going to get out into the trip. We're going to take from Saline, you would just take uh, US 12 East into downtown Dearborn, and you would hit Monroe Street and make a left hand turn and go north three blocks until or south, excuse me, three blocks until it ends at Ford Field. Not the Ford Field at the site of some Alliance failures, but Ford Field, this little park in Dearborn. We launched at this little bay. Now, does anybody know what they call a seagull that flies over a bay? It's a bay. <laughs> now, that piece of information you're not going to find in any fancy ornithology book right here tonight. So, anyways, we're launching on this little bay, and the bay faces north, and you're going to paddle for 75 feet. You see this little gap in the land there. Well, there's some water on the other side of that gap, and that's the lower branch of the Rouge as it's flowing from uh, west to east. So we're going to go through that gap and turn to the right. But before we do that, I just want to introduce some of the people who joined us for this panel for the book. These are folks that are all involved with not only restoring the health of the river, but making sure it's a great recreational giveaway. The man second from the left is Al Hebner, who donated one of the gift certificates tonight. And I know of no single person who has done more to promote Michigan paddling, canoes and kayaks in the state of Michigan than now. He comes up with these wonderfully creative programs. One of them is No Child Left Inside, which is geared towards usually poor communities, urban kids who might never have been in the woods or on a river. Uh, just a great guy. And based on, spurred on by this trip, he extended his livery from the Huron River to the Rouge River. And now you can actually rent canoes from him and launch them. Or, uh, at Fort Field, they go downstream and see the beautiful uh, waterfall and dam in the backyard of uh, Fairlane. The lady third from right is Sally Petrella. She's part of the Friends of the Rouge, and I talked about their wonderful environmental activity. Second from the right is Dave Norwood from the mayor's office. You have this great cooperative effort the mayor's office in Dearborn, the environmental room, uh, group Friends of the Rouge, and Heavners all working together to, make, uh, to bring the Rouge back to folks like before the pollution hit the river and just uh, make it a great, great experience for people. Before I leave this slide, I do want to mention the fellow on the far right. He's a U of M Dearborn professor, Paul Drouse. And since we had a professor on the water with us, I thought I'd ask him a question that I had given a lot of thought to recently. Is, and that is, why can't you hear when a pterodactyl releases something? And he told me, because the pee is silent. I thought, <laughs> based on that coming from a sociology professor especially, that was pretty impressive. So anyways, we're now leaving Fort Field and we go into this really quaint pedestrian bridge. The next photo was taken from the bridge, and I love it because I think it does a wonderful job in capturing the excitement of going down this historic river that's being restored, and the unexpected wildlife we, would, we encountered on it. So as you're leaving Fort Field, you go under a couple of pedestrian bridges with light graphics, as you can see beneath. Now, I mentioned on this two-hour trip, the first 45 minutes is on the lower branch of the Rouge, and there is a lot of deadfall that you have to deal with, and it requires uh, steering ability to get around a lot of the debris. Sometimes it just doesn't matter how good you can steer both of them, because we ran into obstructions like this. Now, the good news is, this trip was taken in 2015, but because of this trip and getting all these groups on the water, there's been a, a very strong effort a lot of time put in to take out the big trees as they fall to make it a great recreational experience. So that's very, very cool. It's a wonderful mix the Rouge River is of both urban and wilderness. Uh, from the urban perspective of all these neighborhoods that end right at the river, the storm drain, and then suddenly you start to see in large quantities sandpipers and kingfishers and cormorants like this one. In fact, our lead boats said as they came around the bend, there were 12 of these cormorants in one tree. You have a, a surge in a population of wildlife. You have a surge in a population of fish. Um, I can remember in 2009, an announcement was made that salmon spawned on the Rouge River for the first time since the 60s. Well, since 2009, not only are salmon spawning, 
But now fishermen are telling me that they're catching large numbers of carp and bluegill, um, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, and they're eating the fish and living to tell the tale. It's so very important. Now, so as you end this first 45 minutes, the last 10 minutes is a very thick forest and the river winds through it beautifully. You can be anywhere in the UP. And suddenly you see ahead of you another body of water that's flowing from your left to right, from north to south, and that's the main branch of the route. You're gonna follow that to the right, you're gonna go in a southeasterly direction, but before you do that, you look to your left and this is what you see. This is the backyard of Fairland, the Henry Ford Estate, and the dam and the waterfall. And it's just so intriguing to come out of this thick forest and see this site right here. Now, I mentioned built 1915, and from that year on, there would be many a day where Henry Ford would be sitting in a chair on the riverbank there with his good friends Harvey Firestone, Thomas Alva Edison, John Burroughs, known as the Four Vagabonds, talking about the big issues of the day. I can only imagine some of the conversations. I'm sure cursing the Boston Red Sox in 1915. Um, now, right next to uh, the waterfall, you see just above the two stone tunnels, the powerhouse uh, for the dam. So from the dam, we're going to turn around and we'll have the current in our back, and we're now going downstream on the main branch of the Rouge. Here's where we came out through the forest on the lower branch. And here we have a natural riverbed, but very soon that's going to change. About hmm, five minutes downstream, suddenly, the natural riverbed is replaced by a very wide, sloping concrete floor. The reason for that is because there was some horrific flooding. This is the number one flooding river in the entire state of Michigan. I would say Clinton Rivers, too, is probably 1A and 1B. You had this narrow little river valley, and all around it was impervious surfaces. It's all concrete. It was concrete streets and concrete sidewalks and cars and homes, and none of them are good at absorbing heavy rains. And those heavy rains would go right down this little river valley and flood the area. So at least on a temporary basis, temporary now like 30 years, um, you have this concrete floor, but the plan is, the long-term plan is to restore the natural riverbed. So about the time you go underneath the Michigan Avenue Bridge on the main branch, you're an hour into the two-hour trip. And from the paddler's perspective, here the river is flowing from your left to your right. And they can see in the distance the Fairlane Town Center. Now in the foreground, from the paddler's view to the right, they see this body of water. Well, that's a little creek with the natural riverbed. And if you decide you're up for exploration, you can paddle down that creek, and it takes you around Oxbow Island within Greenfield Village. Hmm. Oxbow Island, the water here is following the original flow up the Bruce River, and it's a nesting area uh, to uh, sandpipers, cormorants, and blue herons. You see one on the tree right up there. Very cool. And now taking flight. So besides uh, paddling into this beautiful little nesting area, they have a lot of historical markers up like this one, which give you just some great fun info about the history of the area, the Potawatomi Indians being the original residents, where does the word Oxbow come from, or when a river bends around a piece of land. Really nice. So we're going to leave now this little side exploration. We're back out into the long concrete straightaway. Three minutes after leaving Oxbow Island, you go underneath the Southfield Freeway Bridge. There's nothing that quite says urban paddling is going under the Southfield. <laughs> <laughs> and then one mile in the distance from where this picture was taken, you can see a little Rotunda Bridge. That's a mile away from where this photo was taken. Now, just past the Rotunda Bridge, there's a big gray building on the right. And that house is the famous wildlife you'll find on the Rouge because that's the Allen Park training facility of the Detroit Lions. The Lions this year are celebrating their 60th year of rebuilding. They've been rebuilding since people were sporting high light like buttons. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks. Hey. So, 15 minutes past the Rotunda Bridge, you go underneath I 94. Ah, uh, now we're getting grilled. And just past that, five minutes, there's a little takeout here at the Melvindale Community Center. So, that's where the trip ends that I wrote about for the book. But there's another trip I took on the Rouge in an earlier book, Adelaide, Michigan's Hidden Beauty, that started here and takes you into the Detroit River, and that's where the Rouge widens dramatically. 10 minutes downstream from here, you see on your left the Ford uh, Company Rouge Complex. So imagine of all the times you've been on narrow rivers through forest of pine, in the, U in the UP or Northern Lower, even the Huron, and now you've got the Ford Rouge Complex. And then you go by man-made Forest Island, and suddenly it's wide and deep enough, there's big freighters, and you're in this tiny little canoe and kayak. It's really quite amazing. 
The takeout, that's two hours downstream from here, you hit the Detroit River, and you look to your left, you see the Ambassador Bridge, and you pedal to your right, it took us seven minutes, and there's a little takeout, a really nice access to the town of River Rouge called Belanger or Bel Belanger Park, or Belanger Park. Uh, but in any case, it's a great trip beyond here. So now the Rouge is developed enough so you can take a four hour trip launching from Ford Field in Dearborn and go all the way into the trip. It's pretty cool. I'd like to point out that we have Rouge River Water Trail uh, brochure that show different places if you have your own equipment that you can put in and take out. And Sally was with us at a talk yesterday. She said that the, one, the one that we we're talking about is a little iffy with dead falls still. Uh, you mean on the lower branch of the roost that yeah. started? For sure, we started at Ford. Okay. So take the brochure, call them, see if they cleaned it out lately so you know. Because that changes it. constantly. Even yeah. the day we held it for this book, that big fall on street where I showed the two guys pulling people through, there was nothing there. I think they said two hours before it went downstream, so storms can come up fast. It's Sally, a narrow river. Sally said yesterday that the banks are full of dead ash trees waiting to fly. So. And, Oh. And that's brand new. Yeah. Just, and one of the neat things about the Friends of the Rivers, they have two trips that are open to the public each year. And you're paddling with people who have an understanding of the history of the area you're paddling through and of some of the challenges that's being faced and where they come from. Uh, they have a September and October trip, and I think the September one might be um, upstream from Fort Field by Wayne Road. But the uh, one in October is the one that starts here and takes you by uh, Ford Motor Company, Bruce Plants, and these big freighters and the trigger. It's pretty cool. Like, as I say, you're having with people. Bill is going to know it. But it's, it's, it was really a wild trip. And we did it in a canoe, which was everybody else in the kayak, especially when you got out of the boiling waters of the Detroit River. It's kind of interesting being a little aluminum canoe. It's not like we had a voyager or something. Anyways. And their wave trip is very rural, surprisingly. And it has a little white water. It's really a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it launches right behind Gowby, or at Gowby Park uh, and Wayne Road and Michigan Avenue. So. All right, so for the next uh, River College Union, we're going to go to the far southwest corner, where it's outlined in red, and take the Macatawa as it flows on the northern edge of Hope College, near the tulips and pollen, where tiny tin sole lightly tip toes. Now, Hope College uh, was chartered in 1866. It just had their 150th anniversary last year. Uh, and it's a, it's a private liberal arts school, a gorgeous campus, in no small part because of the care and maintenance of its oldest buildings, including this one. This is a stone and brick Van Bleck Hall. It was the oldest building uh, on the Hope campus, built in 1857, nine years before the campus was chartered because in those first nine years, that served as a pioneer school from the earliest immigrants coming over from Rotterdam. And the other building that really grabbed my eye was this one, the Gothic Dinnet Memorial Chapel built in 1929. The name Hope College comes from the founder's belief that this school was serve as a, serve as an anchor of hope to our people in the future. All right, so we will paddle now the Nakatawa from your right to your left, from east to west on the northern edge of Hope College. Now the people of the three fires, um, that, that's not these two characters. Although the one on the right does build some very good bonfires, <laughs> kind of but the people of the three fires are the um, Native American Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Chippewa tribes. They were the original residents of the area, um, perhaps because they had reservations. <laughs> And they named this river Makatawagomi. Makatawagomi, which meant black water, which can be, and sometimes, the, and the Makatawa is a corruption of Makatawagomi. And the Makatawa is also called the Black River, which can be very confusing because there's another black river that's just 30 minutes south of here that goes from Bangor in the east to South Haven in the west all the way into Lake Michigan, which, by the way, is another great trip, that Black River. We've done that the last two hours where you're in this very narrow, extremely rural, fallen tree um, uh, surroundings, and suddenly you're coming out by these motor yachts and people drinking and waving at you, and they're out to Lake Michigan pretty well. 
Now, this is a relatively small river compared to the Rouge, which is the main branch, about 126 miles. You've got uh, the Huron, 129 miles, 16 miles. It begins just to the east of the town of Holland, and then it flows initially northwest and then west until it empties into Lake Nakatawa, which is connected to Lake Michigan. If you decide it's a trip you want to take, and it is very beginner friendly, except for the last 15 minutes in Lake Nakatawa, which I'll discuss, there's a livery called Kayak Kayak in the town of Powell, Skip Neighborhood. Uh, he puts people on this and three other rivers. Wide, laid back, um, there is a great number of carp and walleye that swim by, a lot of turtles that you, you pass by, pretty cool. We paddled on the 16 mile river the 3.7 miles that actually hugged Canvas property. It took us an hour and 40 minutes. And 50 minutes into the hour and 40, we go underneath this railroad trestle, the only trestle we go under, and you start to see some colorful buildings in the distance. Well, those buildings are on the eastern end of Windmill Island. And the current takes you around to the right after you go under the bridge and alongside this rusted seawall and these big rocks. And in the distance, you see these spinning pinwheels. Well, those pinwheels announce that there's a canal that was cut into the land that creates an island on the right. And we decided to go down that canal. And there's another option that I'll get into in a minute. And you see in the distance a little pedestrian bridge. And right next to that, you see the window on Windmill Island. And that was pretty cool to paddle by there. So this is a little canal with hardly any current behind you. We've gotten off the main body of the river, and this is 15 minutes right along the windmill and the pedestrian bridge and the whole Dutch happening thing. It was really a lot of fun. There's a lot of flags. There's flower gardens on each, on each shore, underneath flags fluttering and breeze above. I thought it very appropriate that a Dutchman would pose in front of the windmill. That's our brother-in-law, Perry Vermeer. That's a very <laughs> Dutchman. And at the far western end of this canal, there's a little canoe and kayak uh, takeout area right next to the uh, port of Jack. And right where our buddy is facing, you're seeing homes that are on the main branch, which comes around on a big bend, and now you're re-merged with the main body of water. As Maggie was pointing out yesterday, what we did not do is when we took that canal, we didn't take that main body of water that wraps around the top of the island. So that might be an extra trip you can take and a way to stretch out your hour and 40 minutes out there. Perhaps you go all the way around and come in the canal from the far side, as I said, there's probably any current, and paddle up and then back down again. It'd probably give you an extra half an hour of paddle time out there on the water and see some things we didn't see. Now, once you come to the end of Windmill Island, here at the widest part of the Nagatel, it's about 300 feet wide in some spots. 20 minutes beyond the western end of Windmill Island, you see a bridge in the distance, and that's River Avenue Bridge. And this is the view underneath there, and that's looking to the paddler's left, you see the river walk and the miniature windmill. Now up to now, it's been very laid back, beginner friendly, you don't need a life vest, now you need a life vest, because you're into very choppy water on Lake Nakatawa. You have 15 more minutes before there's a sandy beach for you to take out. This picture really doesn't do it justice as far as the choppy and boiling waters that we face. So 15 minutes are left, and as you're paddling out into Lake Nakatawa, you see a big factory on the left, and on the right there's an upjohn plant. And that upjohn plant used to manufacture Viagra. And over the years they poured a lot of product waste into the water. <laughs> well, since they did that, the carp tend to jump above the water a lot. It's only a problem when they're jumping for more than four hours. <laughs> then they should seek a physician's care or work, which is a private joke that we can tell at the time. So you're out in this roiling water, and you're very happy to see this large dock coming off the right sandy beach. And you go past that dock, and there's the takeout at the end of your hour and 40 minute trip, or end of your two hour trip. She'll be laughing at the end of this If you decide to go around and take a little more time around the middle island. So now our third uh, of our five River College unions take us way up in Copper Country, in the Keweenaw Peninsula, where we are going to paddle the tiny little but beautiful Bay Dot Grease River that flows into Bay Dot Grease Bay, which is part of Lake Superior, and that is associated with Michigan Tech University in Houghton. 
Michigan Tech was founded in 1885, but it wasn't called Michigan Tech University then, it was Michigan Mining School. Because before the California Gold Rush of 1849, there was a QNL Minnesota Copper Rush of 1843. Being 1843 and being in the UP, there were no roads up there. So what the miners were looking for was a great natural harbor that had a wonderful depth that they could boat to. Well, that wonderful harbor that created a lot of traffic became eventually called the Copper Harbor. Billions of tons of copper have been mined in this area since 1843 and have contributed greatly to the industrialization of America. So this little section right in here, the Bay Degree River, Bay Degree Bay, we're going to take a look at on a little close-up on this next slide. Where the launch point is, is at the public beach right along Lake Superior. And once you get into the channel and out into the lake and into the whole river there, that's all very beginner friendly, but of course, anytime Lake Superior comes into play, that can be anything from mild to crazy, so you have to be very careful there. But anyways, you launch to the public beach, and you go down to, and you make a right-hand turn from the Cattler's perspective, where the Mendona Lighthouse era was, and when you get in this metal brace channel, you have a great view of Lac La Belle, French for the beautiful lake, and Mount Bohemia, which sits right above it, which is a wonderful uh, ski run. And so we will take you in there. But before we do, I do want to mention that the Bay Degree River and the Bay Degree Bay is all part of the larger Bay Degree Preserve. It's 1,800 acres of dunes and valleys and wetlands, along with 7,500 feet of protected shoreline along Lake Superior. So now we're going into where the little channel where the Mendota Lighthouse arrow points. And this is a channel that connects Lake Superior with the river and Lac La Belle. There's the Mendota Lighthouse, decommissioned years ago. Today it's a private residence. The channel that runs in front of it uh, is maintained by the Army Corps of Engineers. They always make sure it's at least 20 feet deep so it can act as a harbor of refuge for small freighters when those big storms rise up on Lake Superior. Uh, but it's also a harbor of refuge for people who are trying to escape the lake pirates. It's very expensive to be a pirate. As an example, do you know what it costs these days a pirate to have their ear pierced? Walk in here. So that's a very Now, in their defense, they do try to occasionally economize by eating at Arby's. Because of worst joke, because of worst joke. So, so now it's all downhill. So, anyways, as you go down this little channel, you pass the lighthouse, you look to your right, and you see a Decker East River. Only a mile long, but its beauty far exceeds that. An absolutely gorgeous little body of water, wonderful for fishermen. We heard that trout, walleye, smallmouth, largemouth, and in the fall, uh, a great place for um, salmon run. We also saw some fantastic uh, wildlife. We had eagles above us, and down the little Beta Grease River, we came upon a family of sandhill cranes on the shore. And as we paddled up to them, they weren't really concerned by our presence, they were more curious. It was very, very cool. Now we brought our own wildlife. We had Seiko, the, the Seiko, excuse me, the kayaking dog. And with Seiko, we're in the channel right now, we're gonna go through that little gap uh, in the distance, and that's gonna take us into big Lac La Belle, and above Lac La Belle, you get the spectacular view of Mount Bohemia. The steepest ski run in the entire Midwest. It has a 900 foot vertical drop. And the deepest powder of any ski run in the Midwest, no surprise, for a region that gets 250 inches of snow in a year. It stays till June. It stays till June, yes. And they have a nice three week summer, and it's all quite beautiful. Well, Seiko wasn't quite done yet. and was pointing out new adventures for us within this whole beautiful Bay Degree Preserve. And she found for us this really cool little bay that had a wonderful beach to get out and stretch our legs. And as a nice bonus, we found this sign that gave us just a little more information on the whole Bay Degree Preserve. So, job well done, stay <coughs> Now, to leave here and go back to our original footing point, we went north to the channel, we turned right, we went by the Mendota Lighthouse, and by the Bay Degree River, back to Lake Superior, and 15 minutes along the shoreline. This trip that I outlined in the book is only two hours long, not even. But there are so many paddling opportunities within the whole preserve. There's these inlets, and there's these channels, and the big lake. And you could be out there for days. Just a fantastic area to paddle. And if it's an area that interests you, and its beauty is really fantastic, and wildlife, uh, there's a place out of Copper Harbor called the Keweenaw Adventure Company that rents boats or will help you tramp with uh, dropping your vehicle. 
whatnot. He went off and ventured company in uh, Tucker Harbor. On the banks of the Red Cedar is a river school that's known to all. So now we're going to take uh, within the 45 mile long Red Cedar River, that area of Bolton, uh, through the seven miles, starting upstream from the MSU campus, taking out downstream. The Red Cedar is one of the longest tributaries to our longest river in the state, the Grand River, which has its beginnings in the little town of Liberty, south of Jackson, flows north and right around Lansing and makes the heart of left, uh, going by two other campuses, by the way, Jackson College and Grand Valley State, and on into uh, Lake Michigan and uh, Grand Haven. Now we have more wildlife. Uh, we have the front and center Andy the canoeing dog, spiritual cousin of Saco the kayaking dog. This was part of the group of people that uh, paddled, had, took an April trip for our book. Uh, and afterwards, we all assembled as Sparty. Uh, Sparty, a statue that was dedicated in 1945 and has been uh, decorated by Wolverines ever since. Um, it weighs 6,600 pounds and stands 9 feet 7 inches tall, the largest freestanding copper structure in the world. I love this photo. I considered it briefly for the book cover. I thought it brought the whole paddling and college scene together. Now, 1855 was the year that the state legislature authorized construction of a college to teach scientific agriculture. The idea was to make scientists and farmers, which was the largest occupation of the Michigan. In the 1850s. So the college that would eventually become Michigan State University was founded as the Agricultural College of the State of Michigan. I get a kick out of the fact that Eastern Michigan's original name was Michigan State Normal School. Eastern Michigan was Michigan State for over a century before Michigan State was Michigan State. But anyways, one of the great quotes I've ever heard about Alien in our state, tying into the whole college thing, when this they broke the ground for this college, the local uh, observed that uh, the campus of the college is only a clearing in the Great Michigan Forest. Very cool. Now, this wasn't called East Lansing in 1855. For the next 50 years, it was called College Town, which I felt was neat. And even though this is a college that has a very strong agricultural tie and always will, kind of interesting that MSU is number one in the nation in graduate programs in nuclear physics. I thought that was kind of cool. Thank you. All right, so we're going to launch upstream from campus in the town of Openness, right along, oops, jumped ahead one, right along Openness Road in a park called Ferguson Park. It's just about half a mile south of Grand River Avenue. River Town Adventures is a livery to put people out of water. And one of the men who were on the river with us that day was this fella, Alan Denny. Alan built the boat. He's in a cedar strip kayak. He has a boat building company in the town of Grand Ledge called Mackinac Watercraft. Uh, He's, he is a true artist, and he's also the point man for the largest annual canoe and kayak show in the state of Michigan. It's called uh, Quiet Water Symposium. It's held the first Saturday in every March on the MSU campus in the agricultural world. And Alan has been the prime mover on that for the last few years. I told him, uh, I glad he's out on the water joining our flotilla, and he looked around at all the boats and asked me, Doc, at what point does the flotilla become an armada? <laughs> Uh, he was, as an MSU grad, he was very helpful for us in identifying some of the histories went downstream, and he also gave us a piece of information. He said, MSU dairy is the finest ice cream you will find anywhere in the world. As an MSU grad, grad that is right. That's true. I have to tell you that Maggie and I went to the student union to MSU dairy last August, and we've never had better. It's absolutely fantastic. So when we took this April trip for the book, the water was at what would be considered normal conditions. Two feet deep, 60 feet wide. Now here's an example of how rainfall can dramatically affect the river. When we handled this in normal conditions last year, it took us three hours and 20 minutes to do a seven hour trip, ending in a really road. In May of 2010, we also had the Red Cedar, also ending in a really road, but we launched three and a half miles further upstream. We took a seven mile trip, made it a 10 and a half mile, 50% longer. What on that trip, three inches of water had, uh, three inches of rain had fallen the day before, really raising the water level. We paddled that 10 and a half miles in three hours and 15 minutes versus three hours and 20 for the seven mile. We were rocketing downstream. And when we hit the rapids at the MSU administration building, the book cover I showed you and what I'll show you more pictures of, it made it an incredible challenge and somewhat treacherous. So, but I will get into some of the photos. So anyway, normal conditions in the last April. Absolutely beautiful. 
Now, the Red Cedar Wildlife was more than just the MSU students who came with us. Upstream from campus, we saw a large number of deer, turtle, ducks. There was a nesting goose along the left shore that was doing her best to avoid making eye contact. Um, there was a fisherman who was sent up for the day. He said he had pulled five carp from the river the day before. And the birds were creating a symphony of sound around us. It was just absolutely gorgeous. And as we paddled through this wildlife hum, Annie the canoe dog kept this wonderful, calm demeanor about herself. Groucho Marx would have loved Andy. The only thing that Groucho loved better than a good book was dogs. As Groucho put it, outside of a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. So that's Groucho Marx. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Groucho for that. Uh, so on a seven mile trip, at about a two and a half mile mark, 2.7 miles, we're going to the Cagadorn Road Bridge. So now we're on MSU property. It was 90 minutes to get there. And as we're going on MSU property, remember we're flowing from your right to left. The river is going from east to west. We're looking to our right on the north shore, and we're starting to see students enjoying this beautiful April weather out there with hammers. When we hit the halfway mark, you'll know you're there, because on the right shore again, you'll see the rock. Uh, a very well-known uh, landmark on the MSU campus. It was a gift from the class of 1873. The uh, idea of giving rocks as gifts didn't really take off for it actually is 102 more years before the pet rock grades to go. Mm -hmm. Now the rock has served as a starting point for what's becoming an annual event put on by the MSU outdoors for the last few years. Uh, it's a starting point of a trip that's called the C to C160, campus to coast, 160 mile race. Starting at the rock, you paddle the last eight miles of the Red Cedar River and take it into the Grand River, where you follow the current to the right and take the last 152 miles to the Grand until it empties into Lake Michigan and Grand Haven. The elite boats last year, I think the winning boat made it in 25 hours, so that's definitely a dedication of the time, the one we will not be in. I was going to say, are you going to do it next year? Yeah, because I'd be by myself. Yes, <laughs> I mentioned, so this is three and a half miles into the seven mile journey. It's just before Farm Lane Road. Now, eight minutes downstream from here, you are at the very beginning of the MSU Rapids. This is the start where the river drops down. And depending on the time of year, because that affects how long the rapids go, you probably have a couple, maybe 150 feet perhaps of rapids. This is a great stretch of the river, but for experienced people only. If you're a beginner, this is the opportunity to take out the steps on the left shore there. But you can take out on the right, there's a dirt beach. This is where the river is at its peak speed. And the boulders come up upon you with such, so fast, it's like split second decisions have to be made if you're going to do Very, very enjoyable. Now, if you have a beautiful work of art like this, <laughs> you do not take it through here. Uh, so Alan wisely took it out because there are sections where it looks deep, but it is not. In fact, this is where we came up with the term scooching the raptors. We get caught on a rock and start scooching forward trying to, to get off it. Now this is the start of the rapids in the normal conditions. Now in 2010, when the water was that much higher, I was pretty much where our buddy on the left is, and there was two canoes 50 feet in front of me. And when they hit the start of this rapids, when they hit the bottom, I couldn't see them at all. I couldn't even see the top of their heads. I took that as a sign of concern. And it was at that point, I noticed on the shore, all the students that stopped walking were aiming their phones at me. Mothers were shielding the baby's eyes, it was interesting. But whether in normal conditions or the higher water, nobody flipped over, and it's a fun challenge, a great time. Again, the rapids of the administration building. Your morning is when you see the rock on the right shore, and you hear the rapids. And when you see, uh, you see those steps on the left, if you're a beginner, take the steps. And then you put in 200 feet down, downstream, both from the right and left, there's nice, easy footing. And sometimes they're not rapids at all. Yeah, that's a good point. It gets so shallow July and August that not only are there no rapids, there's not even, there's like trickles of water and it's just a dirt area with boulders. In fact, there was a friend of ours, Jeff Philander, who uh, made money as he was going through, he was an MSU student. He, he played guitar and he would set up a table with a tablecloth and candle out right in the middle of the Red Cedar River. And uh, guys would bring their dates out there and he would uh, serenade them with guitar. So it's amazing how this river can change so dramatically. Now, once you clear the end of the rapids, it took us about seven minutes, and we saw on the left shore Spartan Stadium, home of the football team since 1923. Now, Andy, the canoe dog, lifelong Spartan fan, 
photobomb as soon as I was chewed. <laughs> now across the river from the stadium is the Beale um, Conservatory. No, Conservatory. It's so yeah, it's uh, the Beale Botanical Gardens, which is uh, the longest running uh, botanical gardens run by a university in the country. That's what Andy was pretending to look at. When she jumps over the picture. The Beale Botanical Gardens, in fact, uh, they were founded in 1873, the same year that the class gave the university the gift of a rock. Um, I thought that was a very creative gift idea. Uh, very hard to read you, just size alone. Okay, so we're going downstream about seven minutes in, not quite downstream from the stadium. From the paddler's perspective, here is Sparty from the river, the, the way the viewers and kayakers see Sparty. Across the river from Sparty, because it was April and East Lansing, it was graduation time. And it occurred to me that if we asked the graduates if they were looking for Mrs. Robinson, that's the one we have any idea. <laughs> Magic John is Magic Johnson has left you gone away. <laughs> now, 15 minutes past Sparty, you are at the end of the MSU property. And the river changes. You don't see the buildings around here anymore. It's just a nice rural float. The last major bridge you go under, 20 minutes from the end of this three hour and 20 minute trip, is the Kalamazoo River Bridge. Three quarters of a mile to the left is the Breslin Center, where the basketball team plays. And a quarter mile to the right is Dagwood's Tavern. One of the finest tablets in the state. Built in 1947, I don't think the owners have invested a dime. <laughs> and uh, the, the staff wore t shirts that quote WC Fields. It says, uh, I don't drink anymore. On the other hand, I don't drink any less either. So, yeah, it's here. so now, downstream from here, 20 minutes till the end point, you'll see it on the left, but just before that, on the, on the left, very large creek flows out. We paddled that after this trip. We went in May, and uh, it's an eagle's nest up there. So great little side exploration trip. So River Town Adventures, they have several trips on the Red Cedar and several trips on the Grand, and that's one of the gift certificates you could win tonight. And uh, this is my favorite trip. It's just it's, the whole thing is wonderful. We can paddle right through the heart of the university. It doesn't get much better than this. And you can see Alan made a wise decision. This beautiful cedar strip kayak is in great shape by uh, foraging around. And River Town Adventures will tell you if there's a rabbits, if there's water in the rabbits or not. So you have your own equipment, call them, ask well, questions. That's, that's part of the beauty. Maggie and I have always supported deliveries. They're the people who do the heavy lifting, lifting after the storms come through and leave debris in the water. And they're all about safety. They'll let you know if it's appropriate. What's your paddling level? What's your experience? There's a section there you should or shouldn't be going on. And we're big fans of deliveries, which is why we started putting out the brochures. So for our fifth and final River College Union, we're going to go to Maggie and my alma mater, Eastern Michigan University. This was the shortest of all of the 20 trips, partly because we were kind of bookend it in. In the north, there's a dam right here, the Peninsular Park Dam. And then down at the end of the trip, you go underneath I-94, but now you're in Fort Lake. Yes, you can get a lot of Fort Lake. Many people do. And through Fort Lake, the river narrows again. Uh, but our group of friends, we like to have a current in our bag. So I only write about rivers when I so it's, a, it's just a two mile trip, it took us 45 minutes, and it wraps around the north and the east side of the Eastern Michigan campus, which is right in here, just on the north side of Washington Street. Now, I'll just bring this to your attention because we'll talk about it later. This is Cross Street right here. You can see the rivers going underneath Cross Street. This is Depot Town in here, between the railroad tracks and between the rivers. It's only about a football field long. That's the oldest part of Ypsilanti. That's the historic area. EMU was founded in 1849, originally, as I mentioned, called Michigan State Normal School. Normal because it was a training school for teachers. It was the first training school for teachers outside of the original 13 columns, which is kind of cool. This is one of the oldest buildings. There's several buildings over a century old. He's out of Torrin, built in 1914. I usually went 100 that year. They were lucky to get for the place, but I'm going off on a tangent. Now, even today, EMU, they graduate more teachers than any other school in the United States. The Princeton Review calls them one of the best in the Midwest. The campus is beautiful. Great mix of historical and modern. Some of the history, like this Starkweather Hall built in 1897. And then you have reflecting off the immense glass walls of the uh, Student Union, the Water Fountain Student Union, built in 2006, which sits right next to a 10 acre university park. Now, although not technically on the Eastern Michigan campus, Ypsilanti's famous water tower is always very closely associated with the EMU student body. Giddy, giddy. 
I had a quote Glenn Quagmire associated with the student body penny, but I'll go back to that. It's only a cross street that separates the little grass island that the uh, water tower sits on with campus, which is right over here. 147 feet tall, built in 1889, 40 years after the college was founded. It served, nobody's surprised, to supplement the town's water supply on the National Register of Historic Places. And now to the river itself. Now we launched just downstream from the dam of the waterfall, which seemed wise. Um, and we put in just downstream from this old brick and abandoned peninsula paper company. And you can see some of the uh, buildings on the EMU campus just to the south of the river. Where we launched from was the northwest corner of where Huron River Drive meets the Forge Road. Road. And at this point, the river is 80 feet wide. It will narrow somewhat downstream, but not too much, maybe 60 feet wide. Perhaps the narrow is 40. And very shallow the entire journey, from six inches deep to two feet deep. It flows very slowly but prettily over a rock and uh, uh, sand riverbed. The Huron River is considered the cleanest urban river in the entire state of Michigan, due a great deal to the efforts of the Huron River Watershed Council, who were founded in 1965. And I know of no single group who does more to educate people and to serve as a great steward of the water as the Huron River Watershed Council. Great wildlife. We had hawks above us. There were deer running along the beaches. We had frequent sightings of blue herons next to us, a lot of sandpipers. We had ducks swimming in front of some of the boats, which was very cool. Shortly after you launch, you go underneath the railroad trestle and then the Forest Street Bridge, and there's a great 100 foot long rapid that runs under them. You pass by Frog Island on your left, and then suddenly you see in front of you the highest of the two bridges. That's a cross street bridge. Underneath it is the three legged wooden bridge, which is really beautiful. And now we're facing south on the Huron River, and looking to the left, which looks to the northeast, that part, that lake, takes you over to Frog Island. The section that runs to the right takes you to Riverside Park, and the section that's sunlit takes you right alongside Cross Street, which takes you into Depot Town. And on the eastern end of Depot Town, just a football field away, is a sidetrack bar and grill. The university was founded in 1849. The bar was opened a year later. This is not a coincidence. <laughs> Going to the track for a verbal interview is a long-standing EMU tradition. Um, GQ Magazine said the sidetrack burgers is one of the 20 burgers you must eat before you die. I thought that was a little extreme. Okay. Oprah put the sidetrack burger on her best of the best list, which is kind of cool. Uh, Maggie said their bread pudding is a mathematically improbable 12 out of 10. <laughs> Obviously very satisfying. And these are people who really understand their priorities. They don't have Budweiser on tap, but they do serve ice cold bottles, Absolute ribbon beer, which is always a sure sign of quality. <laughs> now, the bar was built in 1850, 60 years after Benjamin Franklin. And to honor him, they put one of his quotes on their awning Beer is the proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. I think your kite gets hit by lightning a few times, and you step back and take another long look at what's really important in your life. You clearly did. So now we're back on the water, and we're looking from Cross Street Bridge, we see the church, and we're starting to see the pavilion, which sits right alongside Riverside Park on the right. We're going to paddle past that, and there's a little dock, and then a dirt takeout. And at that point, there's a view from the water of the pavilion. And the dirt takeout served as a great place to pull the boats over, stretch our legs. Maggie and I and a group of friends, we paddled 20 different rivers for the boat. And Maggie said, why don't we save the, this Huron trip for the last one to paddle? And paddle it on August 1st, which is a great idea because on 8181, August 1st of 8, when Maggie and I were married in this park, and we took this trip on August 1st of 15, so on the 34th wedding anniversary, which is pretty cool. 8181 was the same day that Prince Charles and Princess Diana were married. They got more press coverage, but our marriage lasted a lot longer, so that's a good trade. That's a trade as good as. When the Michigan Territory in the mid-1830s traded Toledo to Ohio for the UP, that's, that's a good trade. Oh, here's another one for you baseball fans. It was like in 1960 when the Cleveland Indians traded Norm Cash to the Tigers for not even Don, but Steve Don. That's a good trade, too. But anyways, I'm going out on a tangent. So anyways, we're back into the water, still off. Oh, oh, that's right. Uh, this is our five-year anniversary at the park with the Huron River flowing back, 8186. Just like yesterday. 
So now we're back on the water. We're still alongside Riverside Park, and in the distance, we see the Michigan Avenue Bridge, US 12. Um, and there's a great rapids that develop about 200 feet upstream from there and end right underneath the bridge. It just had a little exhilaration to the battle Very, very quiet. And that bridge is supposed to have great for a center. Yeah, I like that. We'll do 16 tons next time. Now, the bad part about hitting that bridge, there's only 20 minutes left in this beautiful trip, and it was such a fantastic day on the water. And when you go underneath the pedestrian bridge or waterworks park, you know there's only five minutes left in the trip. And the river takes out on the left shore at Spring Street. Now, if you go right around the bend, you go right underneath I 94, and just a few feet beyond that is Fort Lake. And a lot of people do get a lot of Fort Lake and beyond. But that just happens. I always try to pick a stretch of the river that is close to campus, and so this is where we ended our trip. And this is a back cover of the book. I like the fact that I was able to incorporate both my dad's fraternity paddle, 1950 Wayne State, with an old wooden uh, canoe paddle. Pretty cool. Now I'm going to leave you with one final uh, river college story, more of a college story. In 1960, Eastern Michigan University students' love of pizza got two brothers thinking we could have a good marketing opportunity here. So Tom and James Monahan bought an existing pizzeria on Cross Street called Dominic's. They purchased it in 1960, and after a year, James said, you know, I've had enough of this, I want to try something else. So Tom traded his Volkswagen Beetle to James for James' half of the business. So now Tom is the sole owner of Dominic's. He changed his name to Domino's and embarks on an expansion plan. And by 1983, he opens this 1,000-domino store, and late that year, he buys the Detroit Tigers just in time for the 1984 World Championship. Pizza is so good in so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the final slide. This is part of the home page of our website. And I have business cards, if anybody's interested, that has the canoeingmichiganrivers.com, and also has our email address on there, so if anybody is Thinking about planning any future trips, wants to drop us a line. I'd love to answer uh, people's inquiries and help out in any way I can. We try to make this website all about paddling, um, a guide to paddling Michigan. We've identified 72 different rivers within the state that are serviced by a canoe or kayak livery. 72 rivers that you don't have to own your own boat to enjoy. And we list them alphabetically first UP and then lower peninsula, and under each river, we list again alphabetically all of the liveries that service those rivers. Anywhere from 13 livers for the Osado, 12 for the Muskegon, down to one for some of your smallest rivers. Uh, links to all of their websites. There are uh, over 45 environmental groups we have in the state, like Friends of the Rouge, like here under the Watershed Council, over 40, 45 of, their group, uh, of those groups. And we have links to all their websites. And many of these environmental groups also have social patterns. Um, besides the ones we've already mentioned on Friends of the Rouge, there's a group called Great Grand River Environmental Action Team out of the Lansing area. And uh, they have five social outings a year, and they'll give you the boat for the day. Can't take it home, but they'll give you the boat for the day, and you're paddling with people who know the river, and they also act as a safety if anybody's in trouble. They have people at the bridges you go under, they'll always keep one of their members in the back of the pack. They're fantastic people. They and although they're called Grand River Environmental Action Team, I think it was last year they did the Grand, they did the Kalamazoo River, they did Tamarack Creek, they did the Raisin River. So this is a really a fun group, and there's groups like this all over the state of Michigan. Uh, we have descriptions of my books, which are all over there for sale. Most of the books um, will take you down 20 different river trips, day trips, two to four hour trips. So when you buy a book, it gives you 20 different ideas and places to go.